Yeah, yeah, so like I registered us, um, and then the other two of you can still create the account. But um, yeah, there's all kinds of training videos to, to step through the different things. Let's do that. Good evening, everybody. If you would stand with me, celebrate the gospel through this hymn. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul. May fail me, foes assail me, he my Savior makes me whole. What rich truth is our strength. Jesus, what a strength in weakness. Let me hide myself in him. Tempted, tried, and sometimes failing. He, my strength, my victory wins. I do now receive him more than all in him I find. He has granted me forgiveness. I am his and he is mine. He 
Rich truth. You may be seated. You can't fool me. I'm not going to be seated. I've fallen for that before. Good evening. Hopefully folks will continue to come in. Oh, look, there they are. And uh, it's good to be with you tonight. Uh, it's an exciting week. Um, I want to I get to share with you yesterday, Eleanor got to come home, and so we are all very excited about that, and uh, yeah, she's doing well, and uh, Michelle was so disappointed, she missed staff the la- uh, planning the last few days we did. I said, well, you're getting to hold our granddaughter, and then you're going to fly up and hold our grandson, so my uh, sympathy for you is is not much, so. Uh, we did have a great time with our staff planning, very productive and, and fruitful. Also, I want to encourage you to uh, be here Sunday as we get to introduce you to the fruits of our new members class. Uh, Lord willing, it, I think it's going to be the biggest I've ever had. Uh, that I mean, in all my ministry, the biggest since I've been here. And uh, that's awesome, you know, because God is working in people's lives. Uh, I think we're going to have... Hopefully three baptisms uh, Sunday out of that. And uh, so we just praise the Lord for, for his continued work as we continue on the road to revival. And uh, tonight, important message, maybe not our favorite subject, but one that we need to be real honest and clear about. So praise the Lord we get to be here to worship him and spend this time together. And uh, let's continue to do that. Daniel, you lead us. Well, let us do that. As we reflect on the person of Christ, his incarnation is coming to earth on our behalf. Would you stand if you're able again? And let's recount these events together. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you, none like you. Into the darkness you shine, out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. If we ever needed his light, it's now in these times, amen. Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power, our God, our God. Our God is healer, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. celebrate this tonight. This is true for all of time. 
And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? Our God. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God. Our God. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? Amen, and that is true because of the cross, because he chooses to use us, and we have no fear. Let's sing this. You choose the humble and raise them high. You choose the weak and make them strong. You heal our brokenness inside and give us life. The same love that set the captives free. The same love that opened eyes to see is calling a soul by name. You are calling a soul by name. The same God that spread the heavens wide. The same God that was crucified is calling a soul by name. You are calling a soul by name. You take the faithless one aside and speak the words, you are mine. You call the cynic and the proud. Come to me now. The same love that set the captives free, the same love that opened eyes to see, is calling a soul by name. You are calling a soul by name. The same God that spread the heavens wide, the same God that was crucified, is calling a soul by name you are calling a soul by name oh 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 you're calling calling you're calling us to the cross you're calling you're calling you're calling us to the cross that's our invitation you're calling you're calling you're calling us to the cross you're calling you're calling you're calling us to the cross. The same love 
love that set the captives free. The same love that opened eyes to see is calling us all by name. You are calling us all by name. The same God that spread the heavens wide. The same God that was crucified is calling us all by name. You are calling us all by name. calling you're calling you're calling us to the cross you're calling you're calling you're calling us to the cross amen the cross where love and mercy meet where justice was served sacrifice substitute on our behalf let's go there now and reflect what a great love we've been given there's a place where mercy reigns and never dies there's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide where all the love i've ever found comes like a flood comes flowing down At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in awe of you. I'm in awe of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe all to you, Jesus. There's a place where sin and shame are powerless. And there my heart has peace with God and forgiveness. Where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood comes flowing down and at the cross at the cross I surrender my life I'm in awe of you I'm in awe of you where your love ran red and my sin washed white I owe all to you I owe all to you And here my hope is found here On holy ground Here I bow down Here I bow down Here arms open wide here you say my life here I bow down here I bow at the cross at the cross I surrender my life I'm in awe of you I'm in awe of you where your love ran red and my sin washed white I owe all to you I owe all to you at the 
cross at the cross I surrender my life I'm in awe of you I'm in awe of you Where your love ran red And my sin washed white I owe all to you 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 Jesus Jesus Amen. Thank you for singing. Lord, it is so good to be able to come in through the middle of the week when we have so much else going on, so much noise, so many things trying to capture our attention. Lord, we can just stop. We can sing your praises. Be reminded of these truths. We can open your word as we do now. And Father, ask that you remind us of these first things first, these foundational truths from the beginning of your word. And tonight as we look at sin, something that we wish we didn't have to, but we do. Um, Lord, help us understand the gravity of it and the greatness of your provision. And God, we're grateful for that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Most of the time in my ministry, uh, I've noticed that I've tried to encourage people not to make mountains out of molehills. A lot of people tend to be bent like that. And it's just, you know, let's just get some perspective here. Maybe that's not that big of a deal. But tonight we're looking at something that the flip is true. Too often uh, people want to make molehills out of mountains when it comes to their own sin and they have thoughts about their own sin. Well, maybe it's not that big of a deal, you know. A white lie, still just still a little bit. I'm, I'm just, I'm only holding a grudge against, you know, this person. Just bending the law even our vocabulary about these things indicates that we don't appreciate how big of a deal our sin is. But let's pay attention to what God says and learn that our sin against our holy God demands death, ruins relationships, and corrupts creation. That's the list. Let me run through it again. Our sin against our holy God, demands death, ruins relationships, and corrupts creation. When you put it like that, it sounds like a big deal, doesn't it? So the first thing we need to pay to, uh, attention to in regarding uh, to our sin is that God created us as human beings with a choice. There is a choice that we've had to make. Every human who's ever lived has had to make the choices, and from the beginning, you just simply cannot deny it because that's how it's set up for us when we get to Genesis chapter 2. Adam and Eve, uh, we, we looked at a few weeks ago, you know, Stan filled in last week while I took the, the week off, and I appreciate him doing that, and a few weeks ago, though, we, looked at, we looked at how powerful it is when we were taught in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, that we're created in the image of God. And so we know that we were created, Adam and Eve, and every human sense, purpose, the purpose for which we exist is to know and love and serve and worship God. That's why human beings exist. And, and when we understand that, then we understand sin is, is the breaking of that. So at the same time, the possibility for Adam and Eve and everyone who has come since then, not to know and love and serve and worship and obey God and all these things, 
had to be there. Now, when we look at this, we're going to start out in chapter 2, Genesis, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he placed the man he had formed. So remember Genesis 2, Genesis 1 gives us one telling of creation, and then Genesis 2 comes back around and gives us a, a more of a, almost more of a dramatic, a more of a, more infused with some, some understanding of why some certain things are the way they are. And so in this, Adam, uh, Eve has not been created yet. Adam is there. God planted the garden. He placed the man he had formed there. And the Lord caused to grow out of the ground every tree pleasing in appearance and good for food, including the tree of life in the middle of the garden, as well as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we have two specific trees that are named, and they're important. And for now, we're just getting introduced for them. But the first thing I want you to notice there is, though, this. God placed every tree that was good for food. So here's truth number one tonight. I'm going to kind of have these, these truth blurbs for us tonight. We do not sin because God has not provided. We sin when we become convinced we need something other than what God has provided, commanded, or approved. We don't sin, like, you know, I, I saw that one of, uh, one of our senators has excused the, uh, the, the rooting, no, let me, I can say it, I can say it, the looting and the rioting. I kept trying to say rioting and rooting, and that's not what they are. It's, it's looting and rioting that's going on. Did you see where Senate AOC has said, well, they're just trying to feed their families. But the video I watched was of an Apple store. I mean, that's not that kind of apples. You know what I'm saying? They're, if they're eating those iPhones, <laughs> they're going to get indigestion. We don't sin because God hasn't provided. We sin because we want something else. We sin because we want something different. And so the first individual tree, if you go back and look, that's, that's mentioned is what? The tree of life. The tree of life. What a fascinating study that is, by the way. Tree of life. It, it comes up in Genesis, it comes up in Revelation, and it comes up in the middle. When you look at Proverbs and Sometimes I want to do that study. I'll do that sometime. That'll be fun for us. But for tonight, you just stop and you think. There's literally the tree of life, you know. There's all these, all these legends of, you know, even when you study about the conquistadors and, and all of that, one of the things they're looking for, the, what's his face that ended up all the way over in Florida? Yeah, probably him. Yeah, <laughs> He was looking for the fountain of youth, right? And, you know, so they have the tree of life. They have the tree of life. And it's right there in front of them. And the, the tree of life, the implication is they eat, eat of the tree of life, they're going to live forever. So that's fascinating. And, and in this, here's our second truth. And this is still true. This is always true. God placed life right in front of the people. He placed life right in front of them. God doesn't make people sin. Sin is not God's fault. Look at John chapter 3, verse 19. This then is the judgment. The light has come into the world. This is talking about Jesus, right? The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. You have the Garden of Eden. You have Adam and Eve. Everything, well, Adam so far, but everything's perfect. And Eve's, Eve's going to come here in just a little bit. Everything's perfect. They had all the trees that were good for food, and it's all right there in front of them. But the last tree that's mentioned, my name is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and we know, bum, bum, this is the tree about which God gave the command. Have you ever stopped and thought about this? Look at verses 16 and 17. He says, 
Oh, man. The Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden. Okay, pay attention. You are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for on the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. Oh, my goodness. So here we are. We have this, and, and one of the things that, that, that you're going to notice here is, aren't we funny as human beings? Because I always have kind of laughed about that, because if you, if you look at it, you, you take all of God's commands, and, and we get then, though Moses received what? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. But it's like God says, that's probably too many for them. And Jesus said this, right? He said, when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. These sum up what? The law and the prophets. The law and the prophets. These sum it up. So it's like, even if that's all God said. But at this point, and and granted, it's early. It's early days, right? One command. Just one. One. Do you ever stop? Have you ever read this and had that thought? Have you ever gone, oh, man, maybe I could have done it if there was just one. There was just one command. You ever... I think we think we might have done it differently, but the reality is this. We're presented with a choice, and we can look at Adam and we can go, man, we've got all these commands. Adam had one command. And if we aren't mindful, if we aren't really being honest with what God's commands are about, we get this reactive, almost, and for some people, absolutely, a negative attitude about God's commands. And you've heard people about how legalistic Christianity is, or it's all these do's and don'ts. And you press into them, though, you press into the commands of God, and you go, really? Is it really that? Remember what we saw in 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, not too long ago on Sunday mornings. It's been a little while now. For this is what love for God is, to keep his commands. Now, his commands are not what? They're just not a burden. All the, all the negativity that's been spouted about God's commands over the years just are not true. You'll hear me say it over and over. God commands us to do the things that are good for us and others and glorify him. God forbids us from doing the things that are destructive to us and others and dishonoring to him. That's it. He's not capricious. It's not, he didn't sit up there on his throne and go, well, how can I keep them from having fun? That was not the basis on which God has given us any of his commands. So they, you know, we're there, we're in the garden with Adam, and he got one command, one command. Now, did you catch what was not a command? Here's the interesting thing that was not a command. There was no prohibition from God against Adam eating from the tree of life. Think about that. I didn't watch the interview, but I saw that after the University of Oregon handed the University of Colorado a convincing defeat on Saturday that Deion Sanders was introduced, coach primetime, whatever, was interviewed after the game, and he said, there's no excuses. We have no excuses. I appreciated that. Because my Cowboys have been full of stupid excuses ever since they lost to the Cardinals. 
There are no excuses. And why do I bring that up? I bring that up because God is so much better to us than what we think, what we deserve. He's so much better than that, all of that. But we want to make excuses. People ask, well, why did God have to create the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Why did God have to put that tree in the garden? If God just hadn't put that tree in the garden, Adam and Eve wouldn't have been tempted to eat from it. They wouldn't have sinned. And I wouldn't have to spend so much money on clothes or whatever. That's, that's the <laughs> mindset that's out, yeah. Like, it's, and, and can I just say this? Here's the next truth. God gives us a choice to obey or not. Obedience to God's commands is the demonstration of our love for him. That's what 1 John 5, 3 just told us, right? God doesn't make us sin. Some people's theology, I'm going, it sounds like you're saying sin is God's fault. Not, but what is true is God created us with that possibility to choose not to love him, not to follow him, not to worship him, not to obey him. Why would he do that? Because that's the only way that those things have any merit or truth to them. See, as, as we follow this along, if there is no choice to obey God or not, if there's no choice to love God or not, if there's no choice to worship God or not, if, if that choice does not exist, then love, worship, adoration, obedience, all these things are not freely expressed or given. There's no validity to them. And as weird as it may sound, it shouldn't, but apparently for some people it, it is. God wants to be loved. He, he desires for us to truly respond to him in that way. He could have set it up however he wanted. This was all his idea. If he wanted a bunch of automatons, robots, that's what he would have created. And that's not what he wanted. So, the next truth is this. Sin, our disobedience to God, our being white of God's mark, God's truth, God's commands. Sin demands death. That's what, I, that's what my main point was, right? That's the first part of the main point. Our sin against a holy God demands death because our sin is is exactly that. It's against holy, infinite God. This is where a lot of people feel like God's too extreme. <laughs> it's, it's like, well, that's too harsh. Okay. Apparently now we get to tell God, okay. But probably not. So let's remind ourselves of some realities here. Remember, God warned Adam and Eve, and God warns us that disobedience to him brings death. He told Adam from the start, he says, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat from it, you're going to die. Romans 6, 23, right? Well, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So... <laughs> Again, you, you cannot even get this far, and I'm not even fully, fully through yet, but by now you go, there's no way to draw the conclusion that our sin isn't that big of a deal. But let's press on. Because the death that sin brings does include physical death. It does include physical death, but as most of you know very well, it also means eternal separation from the love of God, from him, in the agony and suffering of a place called hell. Now, we're in a very small minority these days that, that would believe that hell is actually real. And that's just another one of the lies that Satan has been able to sell 
not just the lost world, but a lot of churches. This false theology has gotten in, well, if God's a God of love, then hell can't be permanent. Except that Jesus says it's permanent. And again, when people say these kind of things, what they're demonstrating is that they don't appreciate the holiness of God and they don't appreciate the gravity of our sin. Apparently, they also don't understand that they're not God and they don't get to make the rules. Like, at what point did we, I always, you know, it's too sad, it's too serious to, to chuckle, but part of me just wants to shake my head and with the rice, you know, at what point do we think we, we got to start telling God, well, you're doing it wrong? Well, that's the heart of sin itself, isn't it? So what do we know about God that makes this such a big deal? And by the way, heaven does not have a complaint. To, I mean, you can complain to God, but it's not going to change what he has said. Why is it such a big deal? Well, because God is infinite. Remember, that's the first thing we saw. In the beginning, God. We said that tells us God is eternal. He's infinite. He's of a different order. He is holy, Scripture reveals to us. He is holy. That means he is perfect. He's pure. He's completely righteous. He is our creator. We would not exist apart from him. We've seen that in Genesis. We're reminded of the truth. We're only here because God said so. God said that we would be here and we have no purpose of existence apart from him, to which I've actually had some people say, well, I didn't ask to exist. What do you do with that? Well, God thought enough of you to put you here. So the reason that our sin brings such extreme consequences is because of who God is and because sin is against him. Remember what David said? Um, trying to remember. I think that's not this coming week, but it's going to be the week after that. Um, you guys will do the readings from Psalms. You'll read Psalm 51 and then you'll read Psalm 32. And David's When David's confronted by Nathan the prophet about his sin with Bathsheba. And in Psalm 51, David says to God in his prayer, and he's crying out to God, he says, against you and you only have I sinned. I saw a meme the other day that it was like this person looking like, I can't believe you. And it's like when Uriah sees David in heaven. But that's probably a whole other. But David said, I've sinned against God. Against God and God only have I sinned. And what, every sin we commit even if, if I lie to David or something like that or, or you go steal something from someone, that sin is against God. There still may have human consequences and perhaps need for restitution and apologies and things like that. That's true. But sin is always against God. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that our sin is against holy perfect, pure, righteous God. And what we don't get to do is we don't get to take our human measuring sticks and go, well, my sin wasn't as bad as Jeffrey Dahmer's. My sin wasn't as bad as Adolf Hitler's. Because your sin, my friends, is not compared to Jeffrey Dahmer or Adolf Hitler. Your sin is compared to Jesus Christ. And that's what the Bible means when it says all have fallen short. And our sin is against the person of God, his perfection. That's the violation that causes death and separation. And we know that this is absolutely the case. Because of this. Because God went to the greatest possible extreme to deal with our sin. Think about this. If sin wasn't that big a deal, if it wasn't eternal, 
if hell wasn't eternal. There was a famous, a well-known pastor, a guy named, if I tell you the name, will you promise not to go read the book? Um, or if you read it, just remember to read the Bible so you don't get caught in the lie. A guy named Rob Bell, maybe you've heard about him, wrote a, wrote a book called Love Wins. I haven't read the book, but I was told, and everybody reported, you know, his, his basic contention is, basically, uh, you know, there's no way hell's permanent because God's a God of love, and God wouldn't make people suffer in hell. Now, work with me on this. Let's think about this for just a minute. If hell was not permanent, do you really think, even if we had to go spend 10,000 years suffering in hell, but then we got to go to heaven. If that's how it worked, there's no way that God the Father sends God the Son to suffer and die on a cross for us. Right? If it's temporary, God looks at us and says, well, you should have done better, but ultimately it'll be okay. But that's not how it is. Right? There's no way... Jesus, the Son of God, God in the flesh, suffered and died for us, my friends. There's no way that happens if hell is anything less than permanent, eternal. Remember, we weren't bought with something cheap. 1 Peter, we looked at 1 Peter a while back. 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from the fathers, not with imperishable things, like silver or gold. I love that because you, you weren't bought with something cheap like gold. With what, though, were we bought? With the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. So this is absolutely where these folks lose me. Because, again, you can't tell me that sin's not that big a deal when Jesus had to die for us. At that point, they're simply not understanding the stakes, not understanding the person of God, not understanding the greatness of our salvation, or the magnitude of our sin. Well, Adam, then Eve comes along, God creates Eve, gives her to Adam. We're going to look at that as we go forward in this series, but for now we're going to We're going to jump forward and we're going to realize and remember that they did eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And every one of us raised our hands and said, that's a great idea, Adam and Eve. If we go, well, I don't remember doing that. What does Romans 5.12 say? Therefore, just as sin entered the world through the one man, thanks a lot, Adam. Well, okay. Death through the sin, and in this way, death spread to all men. Because why? Because all sin. What Paul presents in Romans is that we all have said, good idea, Adam and Eve, in our own way. Now, I know none of us, I would hope that none of us tonight would say, good idea, Adam and Eve. But that's what our sin says. And that brings us not only to death, but it also brings about other consequences in this life that we see from Genesis, from Adam and Eve and their situation. So remember, the first thing it is, is our sin against the Holy God demands death. The next truth is this. Sin ruins our relationships. It damages our relationships, alienating us from one another. Notice the immediate effect. Here's what we're going to read, 3, 8 through 21, okay? Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and they hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Then he asked, who told you you were naked, or did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Then the man replied, the woman that you gave me, she gave me some of the free fruit from the tree and I ate. So the Lord God asked the woman, why does this you've done? And the woman said, it's a serpent. He deceived me and I ate. 
And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, you're cursed more than any livestock, more than any wild animal. You'll move on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he will strike you in your head and you will strike his heel. Then he said to the woman, I will intensify your labor pains and you will bear children in anguish. Your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. And he said to Adam, because you listened to your wife's voice and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat, by, you will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground, since you are taken from it for your dust, and you will return to dust. Adam named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all the living. The Lord God made clothing out of skins for Adam and his wife. He clothed them. So when we look at all of the rest of this passage, you'll notice the immediate effects of sin in chapter 3, verse 8. What are they doing? They're hiding from God. I mean, they're, they're pulling their best Jonah impression. <laughs> you study the book of Jonah. You, you remember Jonah. Jonah's running from God. He's running from God. He gets on the boat. And then God sends the storm. And the, the pagan sailors are throwing lots. And finally Jonah says, yeah, it's me, guys. I'm running from the God who created the heavens and the earth. And the sailors look at him and go, where did you think we were going? If, if, you, if God is really the God of the heavens and the earth, where, where were you going to go? David says in the psalm, where can I fly, flee from you? Where can I hide? If I go into the deepest depths, you're there. If I go to the highest, right? And right here, they're hiding in the garden. And God asks a question. And understand that God never asks questions that he doesn't know the answer to because God already knows everything. But one of the reasons God asks questions is to expose us. And he asked this question to expose Adam and Eve. But just the fact that they were hiding already tells you that the relationship has been fractured. So when Adam and Eve are confronted with their sin, the blame game starts. In chapter 3, verse 12, as I've made a big deal of more than once, Adam blames Eve and God. Let me say that again. Adam blames Eve and God. Look at me. These are the only two relationships Adam has. That's it. Sin will ruin our relationships. It fractures our relationships. It just... It, at beginning until the until the Lord came and freed us, it had consigned us to eternal hell. But even now, as Christians, our sin damages can destroy marriages, bring parents and children to an impasse, end friendships. Split churches. Hmm. That's what sin does between us. But our sin is such a big deal. It doesn't only affect us as I wrap it up or get close to wrapping it up. Remember, we were put on this earth to be in charge of all creation. We talked about the cultural mandate. Go... Be fruitful, multiply, and rule over all the creation. God put us as human beings in charge of creation. And sure enough, you get to chapter 3, verse 17, the ground is cursed. The ground is cursed. Lest we think it's some small issue, let's look at Romans 8. Probably familiar to most of you. Starting in verse 19. For the creation eagerly awaits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility. Listen to this, guys. Creation, the created order, the natural world was, cre was subjected to futility, not willingly, be be but because of him 
who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Truth, creation is corrupted because of human sin. Hmm. So when we put all this together, the answer is clear. Yes, our sin is that big of a deal. It's not for us to take lightly, nor is it for us to leave unconfessed. Praise God, he has made a way. I want to cover just two more passages, one of which every time I read it, it grabs my guts. And here it is in Hebrews chapter 10. For if we deliberately sin after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire about to consume the adversaries. If anyone disregards Moses' law, he dies without mercy, based on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think one will deserve who has trampled on the Son of God, regarded as profane the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and insulted the Spirit of grace? This is not for us to take our sin lightly. To sin willy-nilly, to think it's not that big of a deal. Ah, it doesn't matter, we're forgiven. God tells us that it's serious. For we know the one who has said, vengeance belongs to me, I will repay again. The Lord will judge his people. It's a terrifying thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Now, here's the praise, here's the good news. The good news is this. The, that same God has given us 1 John 1, 9. He says our sin's a big deal. And all he's asking us to do is agree with him about that. Don't read that Hebrews 10 passage and think, oh, you know, it's turned into something ugly now. I've got to beat myself. I've got to, I've got to, no. Here's what God asks. Here's what God says. Here's what God commands. Confess our sins. Now, you, you'll hear me say it over and over. It's, it's a beautiful word, homologeo in Greek, that we translate confess, literally means to say the same. God says it's sin. We're supposed to say the same as God. We're supposed to agree with him. And the moment, the moment that we say the same as God about our sin, we've repented, we've turned from our sin, and we've turned to our Savior. And he forgives our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I hope that we see tonight that the fact that our sin is a big deal is a part of a motivating factor for us to live the life that we were created to live, to love and serve and obey and worship God, and not to fall into the, the dregs of sin for which Christ had to die. But praise God, when we do sin, he's created that way for us to be forgiven. And that's just a time for praise for, to me. I'm going to come down here. We're going to respond. Daniel's going to lead us in a song as we wrap it up. If there's anybody who would like to talk or pray about anything in regards to this or something else tonight, I'll be down here uh, waiting for you. But let's stand together. Lord, as we come to the end of the service, we praise you. We praise you that you are so gracious with us. Lord, if you were like us, you would have written us off. You would have given us up. But you didn't. You are holy and loving and righteous and just. So you paid the ultimate price. So Lord, all at once, help us put our arms around the concept of the gravity of our sin and the greatness of our salvation. And even now, perhaps as some sins are confessed, as we agree with you about our sin, thank you for forgiving us. Daniel, please lead us.
Become his righteousness, he humbled himself, carried the cross, love so amazing, love so amazing, Jesus Messiah. Name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven. Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, His body the bread, His blood the wine, broken and poured out all for love. The whole earth trembled and the veil was torn. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus Messiah. Name above all names. Blessed Redeemer. Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. Messiah, name above all names, the blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, a rescue, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from him. Messiah, Lord of all, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, the Lord of Next week, uh, Wednesday night, we'll be having Lord's Supper. So invite folks to come along and to join us in that. Thank you for being here tonight.